Simon Horrocks. Uh, I'm a door one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you'll know the topic of our um, presentation. So, I start from me. Yeah, uh, I give uh, a little bit of uh, talk about the contacts. Uh, so, start from uh, introduce myself. I'm a, a lecturer in Chinese study at the UWTSD, University of Wales Trinity Centre. Very long name. <laughs> and uh, I'm a teach, I'm a lay teaching Chinese uh, in my institute and also organizing a, a Chinese trip uh, for our students. Um, <coughs> so, you can see the, in this image, uh, this, this is a bit, uh, brief intro, uh, introduction to our program. So basically, our institute offer four years Chinese studies, and after the first year, our students learn. Go on. The students learn Chinese. They were sent to China, and we have uh, several host universities in China, and the students will spend a uh, whole year to learn, continue learning Chinese. And you can see this picture is one of our host universities called Northeast Normal University. And in 2015, we sent students, uh, three students over there, and that, that's me. Um, so you can see our students is, uh, have a different range, and I have a teenage students, one is 18, 19, and I have a mature students, uh, 70 years old at that time. Um, they arrived in uh, 2015 and uh, spent a whole year in, in China. So that's a little bit background. Okay, so um, to start of interest, I mean, I actually did a, a year abroad as a student, even though I wasn't a language student, I was a history student. Is there anybody else who's actually ten, done any study abroad during their, their time? Um, I mean, we thought it was important to think about the context of learning in a year abroad because it is very different to learning in your host university. Um, and um, it's actually becoming increasingly common as well. So there are certain universities, Cardiff University I'm aware of, uh, De Montfort University, that actually are trying to build this into more and more <coughs> programmes for all students where they can possibly do it, opportunities for learning abroad. So where it used to be the preserve maybe of a handful of people or less people on language programmes and kind of, you know, certain programmes that have links with Erasmus and so on, now it's becoming quite a sort of mainstream part of UK higher education. But I think with that, we need to kind of think a bit more deeply about what that actually means as a learning um, experience. So as part of the preparation for this, we were doing a bit of bibliographical research. And uh, to my amazement, we actually found that there's a whole academic journal devoted to the experience of studying abroad in America. So I think it's quite a big kind of phenomenon in American universities. And uh, the quotation at the bottom, I'm not sure how you can read that back, uh, comes from uh, an article from that journal. Um, which actually starts to talk about how social media might have started to change the learning experience of students taking that study abroad um, time. The article is actually about how um, being abroad now still allows you to be properly connected to your home networks, to your family networks and so on, but I think some of what we're going to be talking about um, is entirely kind of applicable. Um, it's more about now the links that you have to your home university and to your kind of existing learning networks. So, um, uh, going back, I suppose that, that um, previous quotation talks about the fact that one of the, the original concepts of learning abroad is that, in a, in a sense, that you are disconnected, that you actually go away and you kind of immerse yourself in um, the new culture. But clearly, in the social media uh, world, that's not really the case. And there's a danger that if you believe in that old concept of study abroad, you might think that social media actually takes something away from relocating and immersing yourself in another culture. But what we'd like to argue in a sort of positive sense is that there are actually some potential benefits to using social media um, uh, uh, and that these you know, summarise some of them, that really that what social media can offer is it can offer a kind of support network in different ways or support networks plural while you're abroad. It can actually enrich the experience um, uh, and it can enrich the experience well illustrated in, in, a, in a way. Um, in a minute, um, it can enrich it before you go, while you're there, and after you're there. So it's actually something that kind of provides a kind of, you know, a, a context um, to the experience. So moving on to the specifics, um, in this case, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, WeChat as a platform. Just out of interest, 
um, who knows anything about WeChat? Have you come across WeChat before? Anybody actually use it? Do you actually use it at all? Yeah, yeah you do use it. Okay, so um, it's interesting. Um, if you, you can look at it on Twitter, you can find a WeChat app on Twitter, just find out a bit more about it. Um, this kind of gives you an introduction to it. Um, uh, interesting, we did it, we'll talk about it later. We did a bit of survey with the students that use this, and they described it as WhatsApp plus Twitter, um, uh, and uh, that's a reasonable starting point. But I think the thing that we would like to sort of emphasize is that um, for this context, it was a very kind of obvious choice. And the obvious choice because that um, some of the mainstream um, platforms uh, that we might be using and that students are using, Facebook, Twitter and, and so on, are actually officially prohibited in China. You can use them, people do use them, they kind of, there's a workaround um, for using them. But obviously if you're sanctioning and actually encouraging social media use by your students in China, it's probably sensible not to do something that's uh, actually officially prohibited. But interestingly also, this is something which um, actually has a very specific political and cultural um, context. I think the political element of it really is that it is obviously sanctioned and it is supported you know, within the context of um, uh, uh, China. But also, you know, as you'll see from the figures, it's become you know, massively popular within um, the country and also in terms of the diaspora. So um, uh, people who have Chinese family or, or friends or connected to Chinese kind of institutions often use it when they're outside of China to connect themselves back into that wider sense of China. And I think we, here we just wanted to mention, um, uh, I, we didn't put it on the slide, which is a bit of a fail, but if you look up on the, the hashtag, you'll see that we've mentioned this um, Chinese concept of guanxi, um, and guanxi is actually something which I think is something which is um, really well illustrated by WeChat. Guanxi basically means um, a personal network um, and actually working uh, and, and living your life in a sense through through those sort of personal networks. And this is how WeChat works. It works by kind of you know uh, kind of um, shaping your uh, engagement with others in personal networks. So Dora's going to talk a bit more about how it's specifically used in this project. Mm. Uh, just a, a case study, uh, I will introduce wh why we use uh, WeChat to communicate uh, with students while they are in China, before they go to China. Um, the first, uh, uh, the, still a little bit background stories, and uh, in tw uh, 2015, my students were going to China, spend the year in China. So I set, about, uh, set up a, a WeChat group, it's a closed group which I can invite to my students in. All, all the information we sell can now be seen by the outsiders. So I created this closed group called China Year Group on the WeChat uh, platform. Uh, first, I invited my students in, into the group and then obviously me as a language teacher. Again, I also invited another colleague uh, from UWTST because at that time he can speak Chinese. So we, we created this group, initial motivations. I want uh, the students to build up a confidence to use Chinese be before they go to China. <coughs> I can let them start warming up. And then once they practice more, they probably will build up confidence and when they're in China. So we have this small group and we chat either in Chinese or in English, or I'll show you later. And when the students get on the issue, for example, applying visa, about health safety in China, <coughs> Uh, about uh, the regulation in China, they will ask uh, us about those questions, which I find that I can I'm not the proper person to answer it. So I introduce uh, international officers from our host Chinese university, and she joined in to answer, help the students answer those questions. And that's before they go to China. Where they are in China, they still use this uh, platform or this group to chat, and they share their their life experience in China. And sometimes, sometimes they um, pose some questions, which I, because the international officer they are so busy, they cannot answer every questions. And then I threw my like some said, Guanxi, my personal networks. I found the uh, MA students in the uh, our host Chinese university. I brought him in to support uh, our students in the daily basis. That's this one. And uh, that's a. Uh, how it starts? 
So we we set up this WeChat group in June 2015. You can see the initial I type this May I type all in Chinese because I want to give them a kind of a sense of a feeling I'm going to communicate with you in Chinese. Uh, but then why I write in Chinese is very interesting. Students answer responding in Chinese. And later, if you see on the other side, you can see that we are also do a communication through a media of English. It's because those <coughs> students only learn Chinese for one year, so their Chinese level is not uh, not that high. So in terms of very complicated issue, for for example, finance registrar, they cannot express themselves well, and uh, our staff will communicate with students in English, and uh, funny enough, they will respond in in English. But later, and we find out is sometimes if I speak Chinese, students may answer me in English. But if I start writing English, they may answer me in Chinese. And uh, it's a very interesting fact. Next. Okay. And uh, except the staff and um, to students engagement, we also have a peer to peer engagement, which students talk to each other, which is very interesting. I just heard uh, Andrew he talk about the, the learning space earlier, and I find it's very interesting about the idea of learning space in the social media. For our students, they are going to China, they set up a new learning space which they can't touch. And if we still have these virtual things, they cannot touch. They f they feel like a sense of the lost in this new country, your new alien culture. So when we found that we won't build this uh, China Year, set up this China China Year uh, group, students build up sense of learning space. They feel very comfortable, sense of home. So students uh, do conversation to each other because some of my students are to northeast of China. Some students stay in south of China. They communicate each other through this WeChat group. So for example, this one, the girl talking about they have a school trip to Beijing on the way to Great Wall. Immediately, you can see the other students put the uh, photo in. And then she responded in, in English. You can see this image, Chinese, English, international language or emoji, <laughs> all flow around the fluently and uh, very naturally. No one thought they feel they just feel comfortable to do this uh, conversation and they choose whatever language they want. So there's no have to, uh, no issue of have to. Yeah. And for me, as a language tutor, I find I'm more look into uh, how they use uh, China E, this platform to learning language. And uh, maybe I talk about, uh, if you're interested, is Rebecca Oxford. She wrote uh, uh, a book about self-regulation model of language learning. And uh, first, uh, we said we set this uh, platform. First year, our students learn the grammar, learn Chinese, just for only one year. They remember all those rules of new language. And then when we produce this platform, students going to practice them. And then they practice them, they will remember all those words. Once they practice more, and then they, they write in Chinese and send to me, I respond it in Chinese. They build up a sense of beliefs, they can do it. They actually can talk with somebody in Chinese. So they build a good attitude and the belief in themselves that they can do something. And then they start up, use Mao, and they build up about this uh, social culture interactive communication between the students. So for example, here, there's one of my students. He wrote something about how he understands the, one, the Chinese idioms, and he explained to his classmates in different parts of China that I learned this new phrase, I think it's very interesting, I would like to share with you. They carry, encourage each other to learn more, so it's kind of a active learning between the students. And then eventually they all work it up, and then nowadays my students like chatting in Chinese more often now. To wrap up, um, we were quite keen to actually find out what the students thought about this experience for themselves. And um, without uh, sort of overplaying this, I mean, it wasn't a particularly scientific survey. Um, we did sort of give them uh, a little survey with some open questions just to kind of capture in their own voice, really, how uh, they'd found the experience. 
And what we found, I think, was almost a universally positive response. I mean, there, were, there was nothing that really suggested that there were any issues or any problems that the students had experienced. And actually, although you know, maybe some of these questions were a little bit leading, um, most of what we heard from the students was that you know, this has really benefited them. And interestingly, that was true of students that said at the beginning that they had very ex you know, a deep experience using social media and different kinds of apps before they went to China. And it was also true of, for instance, I mean, it is a bit of an age stereotype, but the guy that you saw at the beginning who talked about the fact he didn't use social media at all he went to China, but he actually found this really genuinely empowering when, when he was there, so much so that uh, not only did he use it for his own learning, he even used it to contact his family, and there his family joined in WeChat while they were in Britain, um, and uh, so, so he's probably using WeChat rather than WhatsApp and Facebook and whatever, uh, even now. And most of the students also, very interestingly, <coughs> are continuing to use it, and this is what we go into in the final slide. Um, that they're actually, they have established these networks and they've established networks with their peers but they've also established networks with Chinese students and with Chinese teachers and people they've met while they were there and that will obviously benefit them now when they're back in the host you know, the home university um, and they're continuing with their language learning and hopefully in the future when they continue to have their sort of interest in their maybe careers that are related in some way to their degree in Chinese studies. Um, and so we just wanted to finish by this because this is, I suppose, um, the situation that's currently um, happening and the development of this work. And it'll be interesting to see how the dynamics change. So in short, this was the first cohort that we we're talking about. It's quite a small cohort of students who started working in the group. But already now there's a second cohort that's out in China. Um, and they're benefiting from the experience because it's, you know, the, the same st the students that were originally in the group are still there. So they can use them as a kind of an experienced kind of group of students to kind of learn from their um, experience and their kind of tips and so on. And then uh, finally, there's a cohort that hasn't yet got to China, but will be going to China next year, that's now uh, also part of the group and can learn both from those that are out there, those that have been there. And so you get this kind of virtuous sort of circle, really, in terms of the support and the kind of the, the empowerment um, uh, from people with different levels of experience. Having said that, I think that this will be quite interesting to see, you know, how the dynamics of the group really develops. You know, those that were there first, did they become, you know, quite sort of dominating in terms of, you know, we know it all because we've kind of been there. Um, is this, you know, the kind of the, because they're the live ones, the ones that are in China at the moment, will they become, you know, maybe a bit more kind of to the fore? Um, and we'll see how this group kind of interacts. But ultimately, it will be an evolving um, network, you know, and hopefully kind of one that then just kind of continues to develop and to expand um, over time.